Ryan LeBec, I appreciate you hanging out today, man. It's always good to see you. Brad, it's awesome to hang out. You know, I, I love the fact that you and I live so close to one another, and yet we have to use the power of the internet to actually connect like this. It's kind of funny how the world works. Well, in fairness, I live in Austin and you don't. So there's that. <laughs> Fair enough. I live in the greater Austin area. The key word <laughs> being greater. Greater <laughs> than Austin, greater Austin area. Uh, but yeah, fair enough. Austin, Texas is a big place and people don't realize like when you live in a city like Austin or in an area like Austin, geographically from one end to the other can be a couple hours to actually get from one end to the other. And I live in the north and you kind of live in the middle. Yeah. And, and I also refer to anybody that lives past 12th street downtown as living north. So, <laughs> you know, my, my critiques should not hold much weight here, but um, but that's true. I do not get to see you in person as much as we probably should. Um, well, I appreciate carving out time, man. I'm excited to, uh, talk about a number of things with you, but you have a curious business to me for a lot of reasons. Um, sure. you, the, the ask method, I think is what people know you for. Um, mm -hmm. and you have a book, uh, ask and also a book choose, um, mm -hmm. that have reached all of the status symbols you would want. New York times, wall street journal, bestseller, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Inc. 500 CEO, uh, lots of fun stuff. In addition, um, you are actually a certified AFOL, I've heard. <laughs> Adult fan of Lego. Yes, indeed, my friend. <laughs> some of us climb mountains and some of us play with plastic bricks. <laughs> <laughs> some of us do both. I've got a mountain that I'll be climbing, as you and I have talked about. But uh, yeah, that's my, uh, that's my guilty pleasure, passion. I've got two young boys, and so we kind of... Um, spent a lot of time building stuff. I think we built at last count over a hundred different sets uh, together. Um, and much to my wife's chagrin because we've run out of space to put these uh, completed um, sets in our home. Do you never tear them down? You just build them and you have these iconic Lego sets up all over the place? We have pretty. We have a, a, a group of pretty iconic sets. Um, but when my younger son was just a few years old, we had about 30 or so completed sets and he made his way into um, the room where they were kept when uh, the nanny was here. And I, I don't know if she, she fully appreciated the amount of work that goes into building these things. And we came home one day and it was like Godzilla had gone through <laughs> like Metropolis and just destroyed all of these things. My older son, who was probably like five or six at the time, was just devastated so we did have a bit of a rebuild it was kind of like a um you know like the great earthquake of maybe 2000 and i don't know 15 16 something like that 18 um <laughs> so we did have a bit of a rebuild but uh, yeah we try to keep them um just because uh i don't know why not that's great <laughs> these are these are learning lessons for uh your children um exactly while i'm uh derailing us do you, have you had any of those rebuilding sessions inside of business or has it been steady growth for uh, the ass method yeah. over time? Yeah. So what's really funny is, um, you know, I've, I've used Lego as a metaphor, um, in a lot of different ways, both in what we teach in our company, but also in what we've experienced in our company. And, and one of the metaphors that I think is really appropriate, and it'll answer your question about what we've had to do in our business is sometimes you have to break what you've built mm. to build something better. And, and it's sort of like Lego, right? Like you have a certain number of Lego bricks, you have a, a table on which you're building your Lego, but at some time, at some point, the table becomes full. Like there's just no more room. And if you want to build something better, you have to break what you've built. And it's counterintuitive. Most people think that you just keep building on top of what you've done, but sometimes the answer is take the pieces apart, put them in the bucket and start over again. And there've been a few times in our company's history where we've done that. Like for example, um, I'll give you a, a, a practical real example. And I shared this in a, in a mastermind that, that you and I have both spoken at and, and been part of before, um, where I shared the story of how we shut down a mastermind in our business that was doing about $2 million a year in revenue. So we had a high level mastermind in our business that we sold for at its peak $40,000 a year. It was a $40,000 a year program. Um, and, um, you know, we were approaching 50 people in that program and, um, it reached this point where I realized that if we wanted to scale the business further, this was actually the thing that was the bottleneck in the business because mm. the format through which the mastermind was delivered could not expand beyond that. We would have had to just reimagine, rethink the whole thing. So, um, we did a Seinfeld and quite literally at our peak, we had a wait list of people waiting to come in 
in the front of the room, the last day of the in-person mastermind, I stood up and I said, this is going to come to a surprise to many people in this room. Um, but this session that we're in right here right now today is the last session that this mastermind is ever going to have. We're actually ending it after today. And I had not leaked that to anybody. I mean, jaws were on the floor because people thought like this was like, why would you do this at your peak? And, and, and I think sometimes it's that scary thing. Like we're afraid to go after great and giving up good. It's like people are afraid to give up good in order to go after great. And so we shut that down. We had a 50 person mastermind and we replaced it with a coaching program that now has over 500 people in that program. So we shut up, you know, $2 million a year business division and replaced it with a more than $10 million a year business division over time. So I think it's scary to kind of sometimes cut off those things. But, you know, if you studied Mike Michalowicz and the pumpkin principle and the idea that, you know, you've got to cut the vines to have that one prize winning pumpkin, it's scary to cut the vines. It's scary to say no to things and it's scary to shut things down. So that's a, a Lego metaphor. And sometimes you've got to break what you've built to build something better lesson that, that I took away. And I'll tell you, Brad, at the time, man, like it was one of the scariest things that I did. And certainly something that a lot of people said, dude, you're an idiot. Like, what the hell are you doing? Like, I'll take your mastermind. Like, just give it to me. Like, I'll, I'll run this thing. Um, but I realized that in order to get to that next level in our business, we had to make some strategic changes. I have 17 questions. Um, but I, I love fundamentally, I mean, you have two different things there uh, that strike me. One is uh, kind of the, the line that you're driving, which is um, closing something that isn't optimal for that's misaligned with future goals right yeah. and in this case it was it sounds like it, it was that you felt like you could have a bigger business there and for what energy and effort was going into and maintenance was going into the two million a year it wasn't in alignment with the other business activities that you had is that a fair assessment yeah, absolutely. So there was a cap in growth. That was one thing. And there was also a cap in format. So at the time, we were making a strategic shift in our business away from a, call it a personality-driven business around a human being, which I found many, mas not all masterminds, but many masterminds are built around that model. There's a magnetizing, charismatic leader at the front of the room that brings a group of people together inside that space. And we were shifting away from that model of built around a person, right? Built around one human being to build around a methodology and building a coaching program that would scale and ultimately serve a lot more people that was not limited to, you know, being because of, you know, one person, mm. but be, 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 being because of a methodology, a technology that could reach a lot more people. So it was a growth ceiling bit. And it was also a strategic shift in the sort of, sort of intention and direction of the business as well. Mm -hmm. The, the, the other thing that struck me was, uh, I think th that is an example of it possibly, but there are other areas, um, and I'm curious how you think about this from a software perspective, and we probably should back up and talk about your software mm -hmm. product and the mm -hmm. Ask Method and how it works, but I am at a point where um, we are bloated from a tech perspective, and so we are mm -hmm. ripping things apart and redesigning. And uh, when you talk about the table being full, uh, mm -hmm. I, I go through our, so we've lived uh, in, we've got a whole bunch of custom software that we wrote. And then we also have Salesforce as a backbone for our CRM. The number of bizarre workflows, email sequences, automations that exist in there, it's astounding. And uh, on the one hand, uh, the, the meticulous um, pragmatic uh, portion of me wants to go through every single one audit every single one, see what they're doing, what they're not doing. But then what you just said is actually where we landed, which is a lot of this, I'm just going to sweep off the table and put in the trash. <laughs> and I'm going to trust yeah. that I can rebuild based on the experience that we've had. I can create new stuff. And uh, the lessons that came from everything that's on the table are going to get pulled into the future. And might I miss something? Might we have to rebuild it over time? Yeah. But I think that the lessons and the opportunity, the lessons will come into play when you build something clean also. We, we've seen that for sure. And, and technology is, is, um, is tricky. It's, it's, it's um, in some ways, it is um, analogous to real estate. Um, sometimes it's easier to just level the block and replace it with a state-of-the-art building than it is to try to preserve the asbestos-ridden, um, rotten wood 
skeleton that just can't be preserved. And it served itself for a time and a place, but it's just no longer the, the best and highest use of, of that, um, that resource. So we've seen this in our technology business as an example. So, you know, we've, you know, our, our, our business is we have two, we have a Inc. five, five time Inc. 5,000 company where we teach a marketing methodology known as the ask method, which you've um, alluded to, and then a technology, um, uh, backbone behind that to actually implement that methodology. And when we built the technology side of our business, we have gone through, I think now four iterations of the software. And our current iteration of the software is now used by 30 million people around the world and users. Um, uh, 12,000 quiz funnels have built, been built on our technology. And um, we have a tremendous amount of data, a tremendous amount of, uh, of information that we've gathered along the way. Um, but it's not our first sort of um, iteration of the technology. You know, we've, we, we, we started, the first thing that we ever created was a WordPress plugin that sort of was the, you know, caveman or crayon version of what it is that we do now. And um, it was a start. It certainly wasn't in line with my end vision for where we could take things, but it was a start. And at some point that no longer served us. And we said, well, there's so many limitations around this. We're just going to scrap this and then create the, you know, second generation, second iteration of the software. Um, and this is kind of over a I guess now a uh, almost ten year period, so it's 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 taken us time to to get here. Um, but uh, I think, like you said, I totally agree with you. Every step along the way, you learn things. Like we're going to keep this in generation three, but we're going to get rid of this in generation three or four. So um, yeah, and sometimes those are tough decisions. Like sometimes you've got like um, you know these uh, nostalgic aspects of your business. They're like, I totally. can't get rid of this. <laughs> you know, like I can't get rid of this. Like you have memories attached to it, and um, they it starts to become like you know burdensome. So it's uh, it's never easy um, to uh, to make those calls. No, it's not. Um, but I think it's a I think it's a good lesson. Um, so tell me, I, I mean, just the the recap for anybody that doesn't know, what is the ask method? I know you've probably never answered that question before, but I think it's probably a good foundation before we get into bucket because I want to talk about that and actually the business process through that. Uh, but yeah. give us the background on ask. Yeah. So um, the ask method is a, is a marketing methodology whereby when someone lands on your website, instead of selling to them right away or trying to push them into your, your webinar, your challenge or your e-commerce product. Instead, when someone lands on your website, you begin by asking a series of questions so you can understand that person's situation. And just like a doctor, diagnose and prescribe the best next step. And um, it's a way of having that one-on-one -on -one conversation that you would probably naturally have with another person if you were in person with them. But having your website have that conversation with 100 or 1,000 people a day on autopilot, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Now, on the surface, it sounds very simple, um, but the reality is there's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of psychology that's involved to not only asking the right questions, but having the right premise through which you're inviting someone to answer this information. And um, the, the best way to sort of understand what it is that you're building is you're building the equivalent of a quiz funnel when someone lands on your website, an assessment funnel. You're asking questions, you're capturing that information that you then are able to use to inform your uh, content, your copy, um, your follow-up, the way in which you target people through paid advertising, remarketing, uh, the case studies, the examples that you put in front of people. It allows you to do real-time lead scoring of your leads in real time. So if you are passing that information to a Salesforce or a HubSpot, connecting with that back-end CRM and... Okay.